All right, folks, for once in my life, I'm going to start on time. Uh, thanks very much for coming to this session. Um, and it's about talking about how SMEs maybe should and can contribute more to uh, BSD development. Um, my name is Tom Smith. I'm CEO of Wireless Connect for my sins. We're a small ISP operating in Ireland. Um, we do small donations, and I mean on the humble side of donations to the OpenBSD Foundation personally and with some company resources. Uh, and we're a fan. Um, we do use FreeBSD as well. And uh, we do uh, appreciate the, the work uh, that many of you volunteers have done and how much it actually helps my own business. Um, and I suppose we funded a few small features in uh, OpenBSD, protected bridge ports. So that's basically where you put, the, put two ports in the same protected port group, they're isolated. So it's like protected ports and, and switches and stuff like that. And also a static ARP mode for interfaces. And I remember asking Henning Brower about this and he says, well, we support ARP being on and we support ARP being off and you want it half on, half off. So it's probably something to doable. Basically what it does is it allows you just that you will only learn uh, addresses of known clients, but you will respond to ARP requests. So you don't actually populate an ARP table from ARP replies, you only use a static ARP. So it's just a handy way for gateway enforcement um, uh, in ISPs uh, on a broadband network gateway or a BNG. Uh, we also, I work on the N-Shell port, um, so Chris Capuccio authored it, he's from Oregon. And uh, I've done some work and I maintain the port for OpenBSD or try to maintain it or look like I maintain it and other people do the real work. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, but genuinely um, BSD, the various different, uh, particularly like if you look at the big impact from big players like, like so Netflix, uh, you know, trying to push the boundaries of speeds on free BSD, that does have a trickle down effect and there are lessons learned from the other BSD community from people who have actually been pushing the boundaries of what's possible with free BSD with you know 100 gig plus network cards. And so there is, so there's a big impact from big players. And of course, they already fund big initiatives with the free BSD Foundation. The free BSD Foundation does excellent work in terms of advocating for BSD and supporting this conference. And I really do appreciate that. But then maybe there's a place for the smaller guy to make a smaller impact and make a lower the barrier of entry for people to, to support and, and improve BSD. And it's just a small thing, so. Um, and, you know, if I look at OpenBGBD, OpenBGBD enjoyed significant support. Um, I should have also actually added FreeBSD Foundation to that, but originally, Bird was kind of the main uh, uh, BGP speaker for the largest internet exchanges in the world. And the community of, you know, routing engineers said, this, is, this monoculture is not good enough. Like, there's nothing wrong with BIRD at all. But it was just, it was, people were increasingly reliant on internet exchanges being absolutely crucial for internet traffic. And so they said, you know what, we need to have a viable alternative. And so there was significant amount of effort uh, and funding put into the likes of Claudio. And so those big projects are a great success. But can we take those lessons learned and apply for it? And FreeBSD then have supported Claudio in, in ports in OpenBGBD to actually update the kernel routing table for FreeBSD, which is, is uh, uh, great. It's great. It's great to see the cross pollination between the projects, and hopefully, we see more of it. Um, this talk is about increasing funding into BSD as opposed to diverting it from the bigger, you know, it's not about taking from the OpenBSD Foundation or the FreeBSD Foundation or anything like that. It's more just, it's about trying to see if there's incentives for small businesses to recognize that they can actually contribute and make a difference. So that's the key thing there. Um, it's about giving developers an opportunity to enhance um, through paid work or, and it, it to supplement their, obviously, their existing voluntary activities. Um, you've, got, you've got houses like uh, Clara Inc., you know, Alan Jude of Alan Jude fame. Um, and I was just asking him there, like how many, how many, how much of his, you know, code that he develops on a professional basis for his clients gets upstreamed, and he was saying 90% plus, which is phenomenal. So that's, 
companies that do provide professional service for BSD can be that vital bridge between the corporate world and, um, and the community. Um, and I suppose that's, you know, <coughs> now, but there's another way we can also do it as well to supplement that. And it's like, if five people believe a feature is worth doing, you can have, and they pool the resources, you can get 100% of the benefit at 20% of the cost. And that for me sounds like a pretty good value proposition. And uh, you know, you might even get excited about it and say, fuck yeah. So like, <laughs> so it's, it's about lowering the barrier of entry. So if, if you have a specific project that you want to do, we can lower the barrier of entry to contribute because now you're only contributing 20% of the actual cost to implement a feature. Um, and so you have the lower cost for the same outcome. And that's, I think, vitally important. Um, <laughs> so the problem is, if you're a small business and you're asked, OK, I can't actually afford to fund the project to completion, what happens? It doesn't actually get a start, it never gets a start. And so it's about getting those people who say, well, I can afford 10% of the cost of the funding for this to actually say, right, let's step up and do that. And that, that, that I think, can be a useful way of trying to get people to pool resources to, get, uh, to move BSD forward in all directions, not just in terms of the massive big wins from the likes of the big, big tech funded projects or large, let's say, routing organizations like RIPE, the RIPE NCC and stuff like that, who support less of the open BGP development. So I think that's a really, really important point. Um, and so if we can have some place where we can create a problem description and then explore it with reputable developers and actually say, OK, here's an idea or here's a problem we think is a problem or let's say something's not quite right with one of the BSDs, can we actually get something better? Um, and so it's kind of like, I suppose you could say it's, and then can we set up the idea with a funding goal and a commitment to fund the project? There's obviously issues about that. There's the impact of the donated and financed code. So if you put like, I don't know how many thousand lines of code in uh, to get a nice feature into OpenBSD or FreeBSD, then it's up to the community then to maintain that code and make it continue it being MP safe or implement the new mitigations that you're trying to implement to improve security. And so the code, there's life after the commit for the code and there's a cost associated with that. And so how do we do that? Um, then there's collecting money from SMEs. Um, like obviously small businesses can be quite frugal um, and you know, they're resource constraint. I know it because I have a small business. Um, and my finance, my finance director, my best friend, Michael Cotter, he would often slag me off and say, it feels like he's running a non-profit. <laughs> so, but uh, but he, he, his, his main job is to stop me running the company into the ground. Uh, so, th so far, he's been successful. So uh, and we want to keep it that way. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so development management, then there's the developer management payment milestones, and then you've got disputes. So th these are all, <coughs> sorry issues that need to be managed and, and, and discussed. <laughs> and again, funding is not democratic, you know. So if you, it sounds maybe a bit more crass than I'd like it to be, but the reality is people have an opportunity to put money where their mouth is. And where the money is being put, that's where the work is going to be executed, really, if you look at it like that. Because developers have to eat, you know. But if we are trying to uh, improve, like the, the other thing is if we can make funding accessible to developers, maybe then they can spend more time or have a better lifestyle where they can actually work on these types of projects and actually get paid for what they're due, you know. Um, <clears throat> so someone has to, you have a, and of course for all this to work you have to have alignment in the stars. So you have to have someone who documents the idea sensibly and communicates the problem description correctly and has an understanding of it, at least, you know, so for me, with Network Shell, it was quite easy because I use, I'm a network engineer, or at least I try to be. And uh, I had an understanding of that. My coding is from first and second year of college 20 years ago. So maybe not, not, uh, not my strong suit. But at least I was able to, and what's been great about that experience with Chris was 
Chris was a really gifted, is a really gifted programmer, and he's a very good engineer. So he saw the stuff we were trying to push into Encha, and it was, he, it, it was like, it makes sense. Yes, go for it, go for it, go for it, you know? Um, and then there has to be an availability of a developer who wants to take on the projects. In the example of Venshell, we had uh, Stefan Sperling, and he provided amazing value. And then there's the other thing I love about the BSD uh, community is that <coughs> when you actually finance a developer to do something, they do it, it's their mates are providing fantastic peer review services. Um, and in that case where I had MPI working on stuff and Stefan, I could see feedback coming from the other developers in the community coming back, making, so I got something better than what I asked for, or I got something better than what I expect, because really bright people actually had a look at it and went, we can tweak this and make a, a simple fix. Um, <coughs> so then there's, <coughs> and there needs to be sufficient interest, obviously, from SMEs or interested parties to commit to funding. And one thing I will say is commitment to funding and funding are two very different things. Uh, it's, uh, um, and then there's a, there also has to be support for the idea in the upstream community. Um, when I asked for those ports and uh, those features in OpenBSD, MPI said, oh yeah, we can do it. It'll be a fairly straightforward diff for the bridge, bridge features that I just mentioned earlier. And he says, look, I'll give you a diff and it'll work for you. But there's no guarantee. I have no, you know, it's the community will decide whether it gets into the, and of course the community decided actually those features are useful. And of course I was fortunate enough that virtual machines were kind of, VMM was, and they were kind of saying, oh, so you want to keep isolation between your virtual machines on a bridge port? Yeah, hell yeah, we'll, we'll take that one too. So it kind of made sense in that situation. Um, Unfortunately, I've been told in the past that not all of my ideas are good. <laughs> so, so, <coughs> so it's that kind of, uh, it's, it's about getting that kind of thing. So it's kind of like crowdsourcing, but maybe a bit better curated and maybe less batshit crazy ideas. Um, and of course, that the cream rises into the top, so the good ideas probably get more support and more engagement. And probably that there'll be more developers who will be willing to work on that project. And <coughs> I suppose I will, I will end that. Well, actually, I won't end it there. But what I'll do is I want to open up to the floor. Um, has anyone tried anything like this? Is there any pitfalls? What am, I, what am I missing? So like, I don't have a solution. It's just an idea that I was kind of going, right. I have a lot of ideas as a small business, but I don't have a lot of resources to get all the ideas implemented. So how do I, that was why I kind of was thinking about this talk. Um, and so I'd just like to open up to the floor and answer any questions or, or maybe have, just talk about ideas. Uh, so I have a mic, so if anyone wants, don't, don't all rush to ask the question at once. Okay. Sorry. Seems to me, if I recall correctly, this has been done several times before in other open source and we'll call it open source-ish uh, types of scenarios, not not BSD related specifically, but elsewhere in the the broader ecosystem. Yeah. And they all of these efforts seem to sort of just fizzle out after a year or two or possibly three. I don't know why, but it has been done before. I think, see, sometimes it's also about uh, a problem. You know, it's like it's in, I, I have a few ideas that I want to get done and I know I don't have the resources to do it. So that's the first thing that I have. And so that's why I'm supposed to talk about it. And so sometimes if you have a community that solves a lot of problems and then there's actually the demand for or else maybe other commercial contracts come in. Because if you can imagine, if you've got three or four companies that establish a good working relationship with a developer, it probably then matures into something like the Clara Inc. model where you have professional services. And rather than this ad hoc, you know, because here's the thing, what, what I like about this model is that it's, it's low commitment, you know? You need some sort of escrow thing to make sure that the developer is taken care of when they, they reach their milestones. 
But I think after, you know, if you've got five or six companies who are pushing development and the development is improving, I think it, it tends to then mature into maybe something more like the Clary Inc, where you can actually professionally support and have professional contracts in place and you're paying development on an ongoing basis. Or even if I go further and say, where you have the likes of Netflix, you know, employing developers and actually driving the development that way. Because, you know, they've, you know, it's hard to believe it, but Netflix was a small company at one stage, you know, <laughs> allegedly. So, you know, but like, so we all started somewhere, you know, so I think it can be that evolution as well. Does anyone else have any questions or suggestions or? Okay, sorry, thank you. Like, also, if you think there's aspects of this that are really risky, like, like critical comments are welcome as well. Sorry. Uh, mine's more sort of more of a definitional sort of a thing because, um, like, in the slides you use SMEs, which in Canada at least usually for some industries means small, medium enterprises. Yeah. And then you also use small businesses, which could be a completely different thing. And depending on who you ask, sometimes in the business community, SME and business, small business can be a little bit different because like um, financial institutions look at how much revenue a company has, whereas a company owner themselves might say, I'm a small business where really they're a big business or like there's different definitions there too. And so somebody reading these slides might say, mm, I don't identify with that, I'm bigger than I, than that, or I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, maybe I don't qualify. Like, you know, it's something that more of a food for thought idea. Well, I'll give you a laugh. I, I remember going to the European Commission and I was talking about me as a small ISP and I wanted to change some of the, the rules were being changed in the EU for dealing with ISPs. And they said, well, you're not really small, you're more like micro. <laughs> so I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but <laughs> they were actually right, don't get me wrong. So it, it can be it can be that. So, so yeah, th there is different definitions, but and there will be different, but it's not about, you also have to remember that businesses can have fingers in many pies so they might have huge revenues but then they could have huge commitments that are required to be maintained so they don't actually have that much disposable income to put into a new project and that's the other side it's the it's actually so turnover is vanity you know um that's uh, you know it's, it's that old adage you know uh, sorry i do have a question or sorry does anyone you okay I'm going to pretend I'm fit and run up. There, thanks. It's off. Is it? Off. Sorry. Don't turn off the mic. This now, yes. Sorry. Uh, you spoke a lot to the value of escrow, and uh, you talked about, like, oh, we can only fund 10% of this. Have, do you have any tricks or methods to manage those kinds of things when you're a very small team who might not have in-house expertise? Um, we did a project in Ireland for mapping for ISPs. It was about 50,000 was or 60,000 was required. Um, and we got about 28 ISPs to put two and a half grand up front. Um, and we just did it with a, 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 a solicitor. So we had three people manage the fund. The three people had to agree unanimously whether payments were made, and 28 people contributed to, to so assist what we call in Ireland a client services account for a client account for a solicitor. So it's, it's not their money; it's the client's money. And so that was how it worked. And when specific milestones were reached, so we had a go no go where if I got 20 companies together, I was saying right, it's valuable. So once I hit 20, I was like, I said right, let's disperse. Uh, 15,000 to get the data. It was, uh, so it, was, it wasn't actually a programming project, it was a kind of a very specific one where we needed very expensive LiDAR data. But that worked really well. Um, but it was using the solicitor and using established kind of escrow methods, you know, yeah, and, and that, that did work. You know, and you know, if you have a solicitor, like they do, they have, about, they have uh, I suppose, professional conduct rules and stuff like that, so you're storing it. No one has the money. I didn't have the money because, uh, you know, my competitors, you know, I remember some of my friends when we set up our business, they said, Tom, if you were managing the money, I'd never invest in the company. And I went, I know, it's, it's not my strong suit. <laughs> so, you know, <coughs> so, so does that answer your question or? Okay, thanks. Cheers. Anyone else? 
Go on. I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. As far as the escrow, it occurs to me that the, the trick is to get a handful of people that everybody trusts. Yeah. Now that, that can sometimes be the hard part, but usually not in our communities. The other thing that occurred to me is that as I was thinking, the, all those other orgs that have sprung up over the years and then kind of vanished. We had a, a talk earlier this week that specifically discussed how uh, a project will often last only as long as the developer is interested in it. Yeah. And then it just kind of dies. Uh, actually, I think that was Kirk's keynote, wasn't it? Um, and if that's the same thing that's happening with these, that's okay. Well, well, you, well, you see, if if it's like it, it, like in the case of Enshell, um, it was dormant for a good while, but there was the feeling that no one was using it. And then when it was a question of whether you actually delete it from the tree or not, and then it was like, and then when I was talking to Chris, he was like, hey, actually, no, someone's using this, so now I'm interested again. And it was actually motivating that people. The other side of it is, if you're putting in, let's say, something like a bridge port, it's something small and specific. So I'm not talking about, you know, pushing terabit through FreeBSD. That is going to be, or, or any of the BSDs, that's going to be the purview of the big guys, the big players, because it's the huge amount of work that's required to do that and rethinking. Like, uh, I remember poor old, um, the, the late uh, Hans Peter was saying, you know, he was saying about, you know, when you're trying to go beyond 10 or 100 gig, you know, how you think about network card drivers totally changes, you know, and it was one of those things that, and when you're having to rethink about how that, like, when you think about that, you're talking about completely re-engineering stuff. Uh, and it's large parts with large tentacles going in everywhere. And so you can see that. Um, but in terms of small ones, even if the project has a start, a beginning, and an end, and then it serves the users in perpetuity, that's okay too. You know, you, you know, you, you shouldn't have something outlive its usefulness. There's no point in having people uh, drawing funds or solicitors incurring fees when the project's finished. You know, so it was about that ad hoc kind of approach, just to lower the barrier of entry to get stuff done. Um, is kind of what I mean. Um, Go on. Question for you. At least in Ireland, I, I don't know if you can talk to the rest of the world, but did you have to set up a corporation or any sort of legal entity, or was it just an informal um, you know, handshake agreement was good enough to get stuff like this done? So, so in our case, what we did was... Oh, sorry. It's an excellent question, thanks. In Ireland, the Watson actually requirement, what, okay, but here's the thing, when money flows from one entity to the other, there has to be an invoice generated um, and tax has to be paid and all that, like, like everything else. So what we did was, we had the fund aggregating you know, the money, so each person put two and a half grand into this particular one. And then <coughs> the guy then invoiced each of the companies uh, I think we, we actually did it on time and under budget, yay. So uh, it was around 2,200 euros or 2,100 euros was invoiced to each of the companies by the per person providing the, the service. So, so in that case, the developer has a, some sort of private limited company, it's quite easy. <coughs> and then he would invoice or she would invoice the, um, each individual company that was contributing. And then from a tax pers perspective, that's all covered off, that everyone's accounts balance up and it works. But the trick is trying to, sorry, sorry, so the trick is trying to get enough money so that the project can be completed. And then it's just a matter of paperwork and you do whatever it takes to get that part. But that's, that's a good problem, if you get me. You're, you're already, you already have your funding at that stage and the work has started, so it's, it's kind of cool. Is that okay? So you're saying, at, at least in Europe, um, there has to be a company somewhere in the chain that can do the necessary paperwork, like invoicing or whatever. Yeah. You can't do it 100% under the table. That doesn't really work. No, like uh, uh, no, and there's no no that because here's the problem as well is that if you have SMEs, 
you know, there is a paper trail and you can't make money disappear. Um, well, <laughs> move it swiftly on. <laughs> yeah, move swiftly on. But in terms that ultimately, you know, the developer, um, you, you know, will either, he'll either, like, so there, there's different ways, but let's say if the developer didn't have their own limited company, I could say, right, I'm going to hire you for the six months and I'll pay your taxes and uh, register you as an employee and stuff like that with all the rights. Or, but most, I think a lot of you, like hands up here who program and on a voluntary basis and a professional, how many of you have your own company, PTY or LLC? Yeah, okay. All right, so, so you're going to be the ultimate you know, you're going to invoice 10 companies and the 10 companies hopefully combined will mean that you get sufficient resources to do the project you want. Uh, does anyone else have questions or suggestions or like I'd welcome thoughts? So far, I'm only thinking of things like uh, that don't do project type things that just you know collect money and uh, yeah. d give it to developers just because they do stuff, not for any specific thing. Okay. And I'm. And in fact, we have an example of one that's not actually dormant. Oh, that. So the question was BSD fund. And show of hands, does anyone remember that bad boy? Okay. So back oh, in 07 or so, I associated with Linux fund, who did credit cards to raise money back when the fees go towards that. And it was one money machine. And I created a BSD card with the beastie and all that. They really didn't like the clever pun that I could put the ISC logo on it. I mean, the ISC license on the card, which is next to the Visa logo, and they're like, the lawyers hit the ceiling, but that was cool. <laughs> so I raised money for various projects and had a money machine. And when I removed the suggested $50 donation, I started getting $500 donations from Europe. And then came the 2008 financial crisis, and the philanthropic budgets went away in a heartbeat. Just overnight, just flipped the switch, and that was that. So. Recruiting budgets continued, and there is at least one conference sponsor here in the room, and we thank you, one, for that, and two, there's always a business need for recruit recruiting, and that extended to event particip participation and a <coughs> table and outreach and engagement, and I learned a lot about the 27 tax systems in Europe. I was living in Riga at the time, in Europe, and how some European countries have uh, donation taxes that hit 100% because they think the government will do better than the any individual. It's very unique. Um, in Europe, you have like the cultural ministry that's obliged to fund art museums and performances. In the U.S., the government money goes to SWAT teams and stuff. So it's a different view of the world. <laughs> and the private sector takes care of the art museums and such. So one pragmatic point to what you brought up is that Many nonprofits struggle to achieve a 30, 60, whatever ratio of programming to overhead. Partnering up with businesses who are just turning over money all the time can be extremely efficient. If you're just, say, we want to put this money into this conference and just make sure it gets paid, they'll generally do it free of charge because they believe in the, the, uh, the, the cause. And often, the advertising is just written off as advertising. You don't need a public benefit registration and all that overhead. So the one final point, unless you have specific questions, is never assume people's motivations. People are amazing. They will give for their reason and be grateful for it and be welcoming of all these unique perspectives.
Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that contribution. Um, also, I'm just seeing Benedict there, and I'm reminded that uh, the call for papers for the Euro BSD Con, which is tipped to be the best BSD conference of the year. <laughs> press, press and company <laughs> excluded. <laughs> so no, no, but we'd we'd love to, and also it's in Dublin, and we'd love to have you. Um, we do like when people visit our country. Um, so definitely, we'd love to have you in Ireland. Um, I'm not involved in the organising committee, um, but uh, and I do appreciate there's a couple of guys there who are on both committees. So I appreciate what you do, um, but. It is cool, so it'll be in Dublin, so, you know, there's a Guinness factory, there's some whiskey stuff, uh, there's also some Irish dancing, and, and uh, yeah, and, <coughs> and you'll have a very good selection of bars to go to, uh, but yeah, well, we'd, we'd love to have you, so please, the call for papers is open, submit early, submit often, um, but uh, getting back to the point on the have other people ideas or suggestions just on oh thanks benedict thanks would creating a association make sense in this case where p companies come together for the sole purpose of you know not competing but developing something together pooling resources monetary and you know other well, I mean, it worked for Intel back in the 90s, wasn't it, when they to jointly research all the expensive stuff together, I think. But it, it does. I think it does. I think it would make sense. Or perhaps maybe, I don't know if the, I don't know the setup of the foundations or is the restrictions there. Yeah, with being the former, uh, you know, vice president of the FreeBSD Foundation, we always had this, like, people couldn't make targeted donations to develop a certain feature or make Wi-Fi better or something. So we were always needing to have not only a certain, you know, big company or small company even to donate towards a certain feature. It has to have also other people chipping in or non-companies chipping into that. But an association, as far as I can understand it from my limited uh, European uh, knowledge about these topics, is that they can form a kind of call it conglomerate or whatever it is, to pool their resources together towards a common goal that they then all participate in, whether it is monetary-wise or providing developer time or, I yeah. don't know, a room to sit in. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Benedict. Appreciate that. And actually, just to the point, um, CLG's company is limited by guarantee. What's beautiful about it is that the liability I think everyone puts in one euro and that's the liability that you, the maximum liability you can as a contributing company have. If something, company is limited by guarantees, they're CLGs in, in Ireland, at least they're called that. Um, they're kind of similar to a limited company, but they're actually a member, member owned. So each member has a share of the company of one euro and, but, yeah. Yeah, oh. and you can even, but you can also do it like where it's just one member, one vote, which means that it's less attractive if you're putting loads of money on the table, but. Um, I'm not 100% sure, so I'm not sure with the CLG, but it sounds like in North America, what we have that would be somewhat similar would be a co-op, a cooperative. Okay. Uh, and it has some differences, but I think that's the, probably the closest formal legal thing we have to that. Yeah. Thank and, you. And co-ops can handle money. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So although Tom's project and all of his projects, I'm sure, all come in under budget and under time, uh, <laughs> I... You I talk I to my colleagues, they'll tell you <laughs> the other story. I, I think one of the, the risks uh, that needs to be you know, considered is that sometimes the project time is underestimated or project scope creep happens or mm -hmm. you know, it's a big stickier project than what you think it was originally. Yeah. Uh, so there would need to be you know, some sort of, uh, as you said, funding is not guaranteed until you have it in the bank or committed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there need to be some way to cover the uh, potential overages 
Yeah. Uh, or if a an individual member in the the co-op uh, doesn't come through. So, for example, if they become insolvent uh, halfway through the project and they can't pay that invoice, that yeah. there need to be some planning for uh, financing to make it all the way completed. Yeah, that, that's that's a really good point, and thanks for that. I would say if for me, or let's say. Um, we, I have been involved where other people had committed funding and they didn't come through and so there was a shortfall and then you know it was covered between I think me and the developer we kind of worked something out so it was me and someone else were but uh, I suppose we're also we're all humans so like point to that if you have five companies working together the more companies that are working together with the developer or developers the less risk you have so for instance in the project just on the mapping I had a go, no go that, look lads, I need you to put money forward, it needs to go into the account, and if we don't get 20 companies, you'll be all refunded, 100%. If the project doesn't start. Once it was at 20, then I knew, okay, I now have enough, and then of course I kept adding, and it meant then everyone's costs went down. And that was part of the reason why, so technically I fudged the figures a bit, because what happened was you had 28 companies putting in, the same amount as I needed from 20 companies, so that's why it came in under budget. Um, but in terms of in terms of um, the overages and stuff, you know, if like if someone like Stefan Sperling or MPI tell me that my estimate of a project in the kernel is going to take six weeks longer than I had an issue, who the who the who am I to say no? I actually think you could do it quicker. You know, <laughs> like it's like. Uh, you know, um, so I think there's a, you know, in any kind of business project or any project like that, you'll have people working together trying to get to be successful. And so you just deal with the technical issues as they arrive. And we're all technical people. We have all underestimated something or as Don Rumsfeld said, what's that the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns and the known knowns. So you got, you know, um, and the unknown unknowns are the ones that screw us all the time, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll just talk about co-ops. It reminds me a bit of what I, uh, you see in like the agricultural sector in Quebec, where we have something called Puma, which is basically just a cooperative of sharing uh, machines that they buy as a, yeah. a bunch of companies will buy a like, machine together and then I'll have like a strict set, a strict chart uh, detailing how they can use the machines, uh, how they share com complex on time usage. Um, and these tend to allow companies to get mach complicated agricultural machines that they normally wouldn't be able to pay uh, and, and do just get to do work that they normally wouldn't be able to do as efficiently. And it reminds me a lot about that. <laughs> but there's also Kumos, which is where they hire employees together because they don't always have work year long for one em uh, for one employee. One will have like a lot of work at a specific time of year. The other will have more work at the time of year. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, the same idea we could go with like developers working on open source software where a bunch of companies can just hire a developer to get a or, or many developers together to work on different projects across the year that they need in a kernel or other software. And that way, making sure that person has like a dedicated, like, like we'll know that they'll have work over uh, all, all year, you know? Yeah, true. And the other point, just from a small business perspective, like people are probably going to back the developer as well. Like, so what I mean by that is if, if someone like Andrew Fresh or, you know, um, Ray and they were, or Michael Dexter were saying, I'm going to make this happen because depending on how well they're known they're in the community, they're going to get the support of people saying, well, he has worked on this and he, that, or she has worked on this and they have a track record. And so, it's the, you know, it's like, you know, put in the money and it, 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 it will, you know, there will be a start, a middle and an end, and there will be success at the end, you know, so rather than, let's say, Tom Smith saying, yeah, I'm going to implement, uh, 
VMM for OpenBSD and it's going to be upstreamed and it's all going to work. You're going to say, you are in your arse going to do that, Tom Smith. You know, <laughs> not yet anyway. <laughs> so, but, you know, so. so you, but, and it is for the smaller things, these, uh, like I think the existing structures for the foundations, which already do support big initiatives anyway, to, to, for the overall project, you know. So, two things have occurred to me. Well, one is, I'm from central Canada, the prairies, which is the home of Canadian socialism, or I guess Anglo-socialism, anyway. Uh, <laughs> is there such a thing? Uh, it's Anglo-socialism? No, I mean, Quebec also has a <laughs> Sorry, socialist type activity, like the co-ops that were just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we also have co-ops, and co-ops are great in my opinion. I think they're fantastic because it removes the profit motive. You know, there's there's no intrinsic you must make profit for your shareholders motive. That that's gone. You're there for a common purpose. And we gave her pretty much everybody has a co-op like legal yeah. entity available to them. Um, and the other, the other thought was that as far as the managing the risk, which um, was brought up a minute ago, speaking now as an ex product manager, it's the same whether you're doing it here or in an enterprise for profit the more you can break down the task into small chunks, small achievable chunks, the more successful it's going to be. And if anything goes wrong during the project, like, you know, your, your partners suddenly become insolvent, you lose the money, nobody shows up with the money, whatever, you can pull the plug halfway through the project and you've still accomplished something. Yeah. Because you now have had those discrete steps. Now, also, again, speaking as a former project manager, that part is hard, yeah. <laughs> but that is the solution, quote unquote. But yeah, and I, I suppose it goes down to the problem description. You know, um, you know, if you if you if you go satellite level or helicopter level, you know, and you're not actually getting into the detail. Um, so the more detailed your project plan will be, the more likely it'll be successful. Um, there was something else. Just on the co-op, just to understand, my understanding of the co-ops is the objective is to increase access resources, so the for each in, so to access to machines and capabilities that each company individually couldn't, and that's what happened with the mapping. The mapping was kind of very informal. In the agricultural co-op, the example, yeah, but in a broader sense, a co-op is just a way to. Yeah. Also to socialize the benefits. Yeah. So whenever you need, whenever you have to do something, just take Sorry. Money. Sorry. Just r roughly, a co-op is whenever you need a lot of money to do something to accomplish something, and it doesn't matter whether it's health insurance or buying a multi-million-dollar machine or getting software built. Uh, the point is that everybody has an equal voice. Everybody shares in the benefit equally and at least in theory, everybody contributes equally towards getting it done. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a democratic way of doing it. No, I catch you. Yeah, that's one possible solution to the living the the um, uh, living crisis, okay. but. There's, uh, in Quebec at least, we have workers' co-ops, uh, service co-ops, product co-ops, but we also have solidarity co-ops where they can, uh, members can make donations. To, well, people can make donations to a project to become members without necessarily receiving services or working for them. Okay. But still getting a say and how the, how, the, how the overall project yeah. is executed. And it's not necessarily always one voice, one vote. Yeah. In terms, like, I mean, generally it'll be like, oh, a, a small percentage of the uh, people who donate but not do anything will have a, well, like, one place out of ten on the ad admin. On the board, yeah. On the board, yeah. No, th thanks for that. It was, oh, sorry, you want to? And I saw some uh, statistics from at least in Germany about these co-ops and the overall result of that over many, many years of looking at these 
are that these are very sustainable. They have long term. There's a l only a fraction of them who go out of business. They are very sustainable, very stable, and the um, yeah, since everyone is involved and have their own money in the game, but even if people leave such a co-op, they only get their money back that they originally put in. Yeah. There's money to be made when they engage in activities there, but they can never like, oh, I'm leaving now, or I take all the money with me, and the uh, cooperative is bankrupt, so they only can take what they originally put in there. And it's uh, state uh, checked, so I think they have a yearly review, whether the business runs well and does the business as it should be and does no, I don't know, illegal activities. So I think that extra external oversight is also important to see, yeah, this is sustainable and the, the state or the government is behind such a cooperative. Okay. Thanks, Benedict. Um, one of the things actually, just to talk, because I think Benedict was talking about the model earlier where the people who invest more pay more or, or have more of a say. And so, like, there's, solu there's a European solution to every European problem, but, like, you've got 27 member states, and some of them are as big as Germany with, uh, you know, 80 or 100 million people living there. And then you have Ireland with 1% of the European population. But, and so what you have is double majority. So you need to have 60% of the population represented in any of the votes and councils. So you, it's one member, one vote. So you've, it's a, I think it's a... It was originally called a qualified majority, then they just called it the double majority rule. So it just means that all the member states can't gang up against poor Germany, who's paying for everything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> so, so, like, so from that point of view, um, has anyone else? Uh, I really welcome from anyone at the back. OK, thanks. Colin's making me run. Thank you. You said you wanted to show off how fit you are. <laughs> True. Um, so in, in British Columbia, the standard model for co-ops is that uh, basically at, at the end of each financial year, the directors can decide they have a certain amount of surplus funds and distribute uh, that, that gets distributed back to the members uh, in proportion to how much business the members did with the co-op. Okay. So essentially, it's, it, it means that the co-op can charge like 10% more than they expect things will cost. And then if they come in on budget, everybody gets that 10% back. If they come in even more under budget, you get even more money back. But it, it, it avoids that, that problem of, we don't know exactly how much it's going to cost to do this, but we can, and, and we don't want to have a profit if, because uh, you know, it is not, the goal is not to make a profit. Um, so people end up paying what it actually costs, but they put in enough money in the first place to, to, to cover it in, in case it costs more than expected. Yeah. Um, the other point I wanted to make is, uh, in terms of project management, yes, it is great if you can split things down into small parts. However, you want it, it can make it harder to get people who are willing to put money forward because they say, you know, you have companies who will say, yes, we want that thing which is ten steps down the road. We don't care about the first the first nine steps. Why why would we want to put money forwards for this first step? It's not useful to us. So, like we we only want to fund it if if you know you're going to get to that tenth step. So th there's there's trade offs on in both directions. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks for that, Colin. Appreciate that. Thanks. Anyone else? Cool. <sighs> Thanks for the the legwork. <laughs> Before I speak, who's in the very back row that wants to speak next? <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> uh, question is, so everybody in this room understands the connection between, you know, being able to buy dinner and being able to work on a project, right? There's a one-to-one -one correlation there. Yeah. If I'm an SME using an open source product, let's say for the example, I don't know, uh, something FreeBSD based just yeah. for the moment, doesn't really matter. How do I know that this option even exists for me? That I could pay someone to work on it? Because most software is, there it is. You Have at it. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I suppose, it's why conferences like this are important because I did, l like the co-op I hadn't quite considered 
as a model for this or an association. And I was thinking more maybe project based and short term kind of quick and dirty. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, but sometimes they're just purely administrative. While the co-op, it seemed to have like they had the rules based system to, to actually when you're buying combine harvesters and stuff like that, where it's like, OK, individually, the farmers can't afford one, but they get the benefit of it and then they timeshare it, uh, which is pretty cool, like, you know. Um, and for me, like when I was asking Theo about OpenBSD, for instance, just to, was like I said, how do I, because I didn't know whether it was you do it through the foundation or what, you know, I was just asking. He says, find the developer who worked on it, talk to them and fund them. And, and he was saying fund, you know, which was kind of a, a kind of a, a very decentralized approach to it, and you know. Um, and of course, with that though, there's a risk that the upstream doesn't particularly, you know, agree with the direction of that particular patch or change. You know, so there's that side. But and I think you know, the looking from FreeBSD from the outside, it looks like the foundation does try to steer and, and manage expectations within the project and 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 in fairness achieve the goals that they set out. You know, um, you know, with the so I think it's different models. You know. Um, and but for me, it was like just making small donations personally, um, and uh, trying to organise a hackathon in Dublin, and you know getting the government to support it, which I'm very thankful for the NCSC because they did support the hackathon. Um, and uh, you know, it's but it's also match funding. It's one thing I will say to you is it's amazing how many people will give you money if you're saying you're willing to put up money, match funding. So if you go to, and that is a powerful thing, as you say, this company, I'll, um, and that's why I was trying to say about, it, let's say, in particular, Enshell, a project that's close to my heart, was I was saying, if any of you did contribute, I'll match it, or the company will match it. Because that's half of my cost. I'm getting 100% of the benefit for 50% of the cost. So it's a good deal for me on that one, like, you know. Uh, I'm not being a charity, I'm actually getting an outcome that I want. Sorry. To emphasize that, grant matching is a secret weapon because everyone wins. As you just pointed out, you, you're paying half, they're paying half, but everyone's happy. So it's like an automatic co-op that just is magic. <laughs> and, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. How many times can you use one grant to match another grant? So you do, well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's no. Not, not that, that's technically not double dipping. It's uh, co-financing, but no. But like, it's it like for instance, it's much easier to go to a government body and say, "Look, I have a project," and with let's say for instance in the hackathon in Ireland, the cost would have been around forty forty odd thousand, um, which was double the budget. And so I said to the government, "I've got twenty grand. I need another twenty grand to make it happen. Can we do it?" And they were like, "Following date, yeah." That's, this is what you, people will take it more seriously if you're saying, I have money on the table, I, but I don't have enough, you know? And related to that about, okay, double dipping. <laughs> Serialized <laughs> projects are great because you show success on a small project, you then move on to a medium-sized project, a small local event, then a regional event, and then consider, you know, a hackathon with actual, you know, you go from like two-figure, budget to three figure to four figure to five figures work your way up and you build trust in that process yeah. and that's where the matching the more successful you are the more they trust you yeah and the other side of it is what's lovely about dealing with government is to be fair those guys went only 20 <laughs> it was kind of like you know it was like fuck <laughs> but like excuse the language no but they were like look it's they were like look it's not that much money in the, in the grand scheme of things and i was like i'm a small business it's a it's a shit ton of money. <laughs> so like, so from that point of view, uh, but like, but it is, it, they'd have the allocations and you know, when you think of all the fancy conference centers and stuff like that and the big, you know, they can run a serious budget. So for, for that, I, and, and being honest, it is great. And I think with BSD has a huge rep, even to the people who don't use BSD, they know that it's present in Microsoft Windows. They know it's present in Solaris. That there's there's tentacles of BSD everywhere. It's in the Apple phones and stuff like that. That it has improved our lives immeasurably, because the license is good for 
people who want to take it and then, you know, privatize and privatize the profit. But and so there is that thing where there is that intangible goodwill that we could probably all try and do more to tap. But in terms of small businesses, just donate to your, you know, to the foundations because obviously, like, you know, in terms of Open BSD Foundation or Free BSD Foundation, you can actually see the material results, like in the support for BSD Can, which I do love going to the Euro BSD Can as well. Um, and like, I will just give a big shout out to like Sir Alan Jude, Benedict, people who have advocated do podcasts, who, who make people aware that there's this software and what it does. And the guys at the back doing the streaming live, you know, the only reason I'm here is because someone bothered their arse to video a talk of really smart people, smarter than me, a lot smarter than me, giving a talk about something in BSD, and I was going, right, I want to find out more. Um, so those of you at home who are thinking that you, sh you should come, um, I've never come across so many approachable, super intelligent people who are willing to share knowledge and experience. And there's not a salesperson in sight, which is phenomenal, <laughs> you know, so I really appreciate you all. Um, any more last comments? Oh, sorry, yes. So donate early and donate often to your... So, uh, the issues that I see um, is that coordination piece. Having someone to come, so, some place to come together. Uh, having somebody who is like a permanent fixture where different companies come together to one spot and do different projects. And then having that same central location coordinate with the different projects to make sure that they have a uh, kind of agreement that, yeah, this looks like something that we would accept in the project. You know, that's something that might get, that depending on the implementation, the idea we would, we, we would accept. And then of course that same having those relationships with the developers to be able to say, yeah, we know somebody who is open to being able to do this. So I feel like there's has to, that, that you can't have that knowledge spring up out of nothing for every thing that needs to be done. Yeah. So you need to have somebody who retains that knowledge, some entity that retains that knowledge. And so you need to fund, have some way to fund that person who's doing, or the people that are doing that work. And with a sustainable funding model for those people, uh, which of course leads to administrative overhead and all of this stuff that is problem, uh, difficult to uh, fund in a open source pro uh, uh, system. If you can find a way to create this co-op, create this whatever that has board members or employees or whatever that can retain that knowledge, I think that you can be successful at it. Yeah. I think that to me that's the hard problem because once you have buy-in from uh, the different projects, the projects will uh, you know, help uh, uh, give you visibility, give people visibility and say, oh, you want to fund this project. We, ha we know these people that we trust to uh, help move that forward and to find other people who are uh, interested in doing that. And I think that, you know, once, once that initial hurdle of being trusted is reached, then you'll have, uh, and you find a way to do that, you can start moving forward. I'm not sure but I, I, think I know how to. But I think part point. of it is these BS, this why the importance of these conferences, like the BSD conferences, is about building trust between the corporates uh, and, and just people in the community and the users and, let's say, the developers, you know? Um, and so from that point of view, I think that's one of the 
one of the key points. The boring stuff, yeah, it's all well and good doing the admin. And I would say one of the failings in my mapping project was just the admin to tie up everything at the end, balance the books and stuff. We got, we got the outcomes we wanted and then we kind of went, ugh, there's money sitting in an account and we'll deal with it at another stage. It's, you know. Um, and so I, t I tell that story against myself on that one. Um, but everyone got the outcome they wanted, so and it was under budget, but there's still just this money resting there that's not being just pushed back because it's just time. So I can see that the boring stuff, like you do need min staff to have a successful project. You do need a good board, um, a strong board that doesn't mind being asked hard questions um, and doesn't mind, and an executive, you know, where there are professionals who answer to the board and that they don't mind being asked hard questions. I think that's really important in any community organization that the people who are paid to run it, run it well. And that, but then also people have to be, you know, uh, also realize that when you have some sort of community-based project like that, that there can be a lot of sweet equity as in people doing a lot of work that they're not actually being paid for. And that users need to be cognizant of that, um, you know, when being demanding unreasonable stuff, you know. But, uh, but I, I do appreciate that, and thanks, Andrew, for that. Oh, sorry, oh, I have to, yeah, I've run over time. Thanks, folks, and appreciate your time.